Oswald, do you want to kick off with? Yes, here is Benjamin Grove from Switzerland, and he will talk about transparency. Yeah, well, what I actually want to talk about is about us, because we, our friends, as Laura Bush has put it nicely, um, we have a, a lot of power through our buying decisions. So we have to acknowledge that, and if we talk to global businesses, we have to find out how can we make them help us in making decisions for a sustainable future. What I mean is, we might want to do good, but we don't know, okay? You have a cell phone, probably most of you don't know, and lots of them are conflict minerals from the DRC, the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay, so we need transparency. We need businesses to, first of all, look at their supply chains and then let us know what's in there. And then they start their own label saying, hey, we're sustainable. Everyone starts their own label once they're transparent. And then once again, we don't know what really is sustainable. So we need kind of these organizations that really look at these labels and tell us, hey, what's good in consumption and also in investment. Thank you very much. Right. And consumer responsibility. If we go next. Benita, if you'd introduce. Yes, I'd like to introduce Wen Yu, who's from Taiwan. Um, hi, I think there are two considerations to be made before we pass this resolution. And I think the first thing we should look at is um, when Adrian was talking about you know, when the one-off donation, that's problematic for many reasons. It hasn't worked before we went into a recession. And now if we look at it, not only was the previous effort useless, but if we continue that effort, it will remain useless. And it will be even worse because now, because of the recession, we have hundreds of million of people that are added to the extra population of people who will be permanently in hunger for the rest of their lives. I think that's really important to realize that the old system is not working. We need something new. But more than that, we need to amp it up. And the second thing I want to talk about is that, other than the fact that we, as developing countries, we don't want charity. We want the long-term solution. But another thing we also need to look at is why is there underdevelopment in the world when we claim that free trade and fair trade is something that will lead to development. Because maybe it's time for us to realize that free market does not always give us freedom. And fair trade does, is not fair. I think we have to really realize that global businesses, that's not started by someone respectful like um, Ms. Lawrence Bush, that if you start your business with the initial different objective, that it's not enough just to say we're doing something in the name of corporate social responsibility. That's enough. You have to do more because it's human for us to do more. And because many times your own development, your own profit has killed and has marginalized a lot of people. So it's time to move on. Thank you. Elio. Um, we have Rodrigo Augusto from Brazil. First of all, I would like to, to congratulate all the delegates from this plenary. It's been the best so far. Uh, I'd like to thank our Mongolian friend. I'm sorry I forgot your name, but I am really glad to hear from someone who stated at Chicago support market regulation. Please tell that to Richard Posner. He needs to hear that. <laughs> and I want to thank our Malaysian friend too. That was Brilliant, what she said. Well, well, when I came here, uh, I was expecting to hear in this plenary two issues and of global business, uh, intellectual property and bank regulation, especially because I work at a bank with intellectual property. Uh, in, the, in the environment plenary, we heard people talk about te traditional technology, and isn't it time for us to discuss intellectual property in a worldwide range? for us to strengthen the OMPI in the United Nations. For me, it should be discussed here. And the second thing, I would like to ask everyone here, especially the American delegates, to support Obama with the bank limits. We need that because the lemon broke, and it broke us all. For me, that I am Brazilian, we did not broke because our federal bank regulates banks each day. We give them a report every day and then see our operations online. The whole world needs that. So please, Ms. Bush and all the Americans, support Obama, please. Graham. And if, if you can all make one point only, not because you're sneaking two in there, so one point only, please. Um, and, and quite rightly, no points for us. So. <laughs> 
This is uh, Gunnar Holstein from Iceland, and he's going to talk about uh, the Ministry of Ideas. Hi, guys. Um, I'm from Iceland. Um, about a year ago, we had a small uh, economic crisis thing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, um, by small, we mean uh, all of our banks collapsed. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which uh, reminds me, uh, now uh, the UK and uh, Netherlands are after us for our money, but um, <laughs> uh, if, if you stay back, we'll take our freezing weather back and <laughs> you'll be good. No, um, I wanted to look at uh, the brighter side of a complete economic meltdown. Uh, a few weeks after our crisis, uh, we in Iceland founded the Ministry of Ideas, and uh, its sole purpose is to uh, hear great ideas, just like all of the ideas that have been going around here, and find channels for them to be implemented. And uh, in uh, just uh, over those few years, uh, one year exactly, um, the Ministry of Ideas has managed to do loads of amazing things. Uh, one being that um, we gathered 0.5% of all of Icelanders to gather in one room to brainstorm about our values and uh, what we thought was impro important and how to get there. And uh, another thing, we, uh, we wrote a small one-pager about how Iceland could become a country for prototyping social, uh, no, um, sustainable society. And we handed this one-pager to all the leaders of the G20 summit that actually happened in uh, this room uh, a few months ago. And uh, one of the leaders, Barack Obama, went to our foreign minister and said, I want to visit Iceland and hear more about this. So th right. those are the things that have happened um, uh, from the Ministry of Ideas in Iceland. And um, I would uh, love to talk to any of you uh, if you want to hear more about this. But I would like to propose for a vote um, on, uh, on this thing. I would like to uh, uh, ask you if uh, you wanted to start a Ministry of Ideas all over our one world. We'll have a vote on that. Thank you. Oswald. Thank you. I think we continue with new ideas here. Uh, Francesco Marquez Lara from Venezuela. Fellow delegates, it is our hope that uh, our actions are matched by our rhetor rhetoric. Um, I think it is very clear for all of us that we agree on the major issues. That is, we agree on the what, but what we should discuss and focus more is on the how. And that is the main question, and that's what I want to address right now in this few moments. It is said that the key to success is follow-up. And on this note, many of us delegates have been discussing, and what we want to propose is something called One Young World Impact Committee. Now, what this would do is there are many initiatives here. There was one just now about the Ministry of Ideas. There was one in, in interfaith dialogue about a global forum promoting interfaith dialogue. Now, if we want this to be successful, we need a group of us, an uh, impact committee, to measure First of all, if it will be successful, and if those things are being implemented. Because that is the only way that we will ensure that what we talk about here will change the world and will change our reality. So we invite you delegates to form this One Young World Impact Committee to share your initiatives. There are many more initiatives from delegates here who have not been able to discuss it. So we want, we, we want this to create for other delegates to express their initiatives. and. If we are really serious about changing our reality, it needs to be matched, our passion and our creativity needs to be matched with organization. So that is a proposal, and I think that we can all do this together. Thank you. Right. Great idea. Benita? Well, follow, following on from that thought, um, Mazaya from Tanzania wants to talk about the practicalities of the resolutions. Hi, guys. I think I'm going to talk a similar thing what my fellow colleague just said before. It's generally. Most of the resolutions that have been passed so far and what we're going to pass are basically theories that we are, we are hoping that should work. But I want to know, and I guess everybody would be on the same page with me, that what action can I take when I go home? I want to know what practical actions can we do to start the ball rolling. And that's what we are here to decide. And I think I'd call everybody that when we go back to hotels, it's not the end of the conference. Yeah, we should sit start. down and talk yeah. and discuss about everything. <laughs> I think we are continuing on the same team, and RJ from Philippines will, will add to that. Hello, everyone. I'm RJ from the Philippines. I would like to follow on to uh, my friend, uh, our friend there. 
uh, I would like to focus on, in drafting a rep resolution, I would like us to focus on at least three can key initiatives so that we are actually more, um, well, grounded. Like, um, we discussed about the importance of education. We discussed about the importance of uh, developing SMEs, such like the social enterprise of Ms. Bush. And we discussed about the importance of enabling technology. We now recognize the role of global business as, as being developmental in nature. And um, I challenge global business to be more, the, being more social responsible, social responsible should be more developmental. As a comment to uh, Adrian, we see, uh, we appreciate his idealism and uh, his ideas, but it begins with ethical leadership. And so, the, his idea of sustainable business could only happen if we have leaders who understands that the paradigm of business has changed. I'm a strong advocate of a world that works 100%, and for me, in the context of global business, a world that works 100% is one wherein strategy is built on a fundamental, de sincere desire to create wealth, not just for the shareholders, but for the stakeholders. And also ROI, not measured in terms of profit, not just meant in terms of profit, but also in terms of planet and people. Thank you. Sorry, Graham. <laughs> So we have uh, Meridian Alam from uh, Indonesia, and I think uh, continuing this story of how to, and I think from global to local. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to question. Um, I'm Meridian Alam from Indonesia, and actually um, I have worked for the CSR analyst for a couple of years, and there is, yeah, um, actually uh, when we are running a CSR, was not as smooth as we imagined before, especially in the, demo in the democratic states like Indonesia. Um, here I would like to ask your own personal opinion, your view, especially here for all of the, uh, the speakers, delegates, how to make a corporate social responsibility program or even that are run by the multinational company could be more adaptable with the uh, local political changes in every countries, because when talking about social responsibility, we are we are not just to, uh, talking on behalf of the profits, on behalf of the uh, environmental sustainability, but we also uh, will touch about the political situations and circumstances, and also the locality in the uh, respective countries. That's all. Thank you very much. Oswald. If we make them quick, we can probably get through everybody who's standing up before we move on. So if Very you make quick, quick points. Very quick. Uh, from um, my part of the world, the Nordics, we know that when skating on thin ice, speed is of enormous essence. <laughs> and um, here is a lady from Washington who will talk about the new models of um, philanthropy. Please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Taryn Bird, and uh, I just wanted to, to send out a, a quick fact real quick that might surprise some of you. Um, within the first week of the Haiti earthquake, private sector companies donated about $124 million, which at about one week after was more than most countries were pledging. So the notion of donation is so, so critical in the time of humanitarian disaster and has, makes organizations like the World Food Program like the UN, like many other on-the-ground NGOs, be able to operate. But when we're talking long-term, I think a really important part of incorporating business models from philanthropy to investment. So I think that's a really important component of how we're talking about how businesses are going to engage long-term in global development, that we're moving away from charity and more into investment. Benita. So Rina Kusipalo from Finland wants to talk about the global economic system. Um, hello. Uh, first, I would just like to say that I uh, very much like the speech of the boy from U uh, the United World College. I myself study in one in Wales at the moment. Um, and uh, I would like to talk about uh, the global economic system and uh, what we can do about it because I feel like it's... Um, like many other delegates have said, it's uh, been quite uh, superficial, the conversation so far. 
um, and we as young innovative people um, are going to be the ones uh, writing the new economic textbooks in the future. Um, and at the moment, uh, I study economics and many of the premises that our perceptions about companies are based on seem to be very flawed. For example, comparative advantage. Uh, it's comp countries uh, that now have a comparative advantage in certain industries did not initially have that and they got support uh, and they locally developed to get to that point. And um, that's why I think we should definitely mobilize international law and government legislation in developing and developed countries uh, to urge companies uh, to act in a locally uh, and socially responsible way. Um, and if they don't do, um, do so, that there would be economic incentives to guide them to this direction. Um, for example, we also need to th rethink about uh, the environmental uh, problem uh, that goes with this. For example, is it ethical to, for us to ship goods around the world when they could be produced in regional blocks? Um, maybe 20 years from now, textbooks will have a section on environment as well. And I really um, support what has been said about following up and going deeper into these issues. Great. Thank you. Elio. Sam Pritchard from the UK will tell us a refreshing view about um, corporate social responsibilities from the company side, not just from the uh, society side. Hi. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you very much uh, to the delegate speakers. Uh, you shared some really inspiring stories with us, so thank you for that. Um, I'd just like to briefly mention um, the advantages uh, to companies if they take on corporate responsibility programs, uh, because often when companies talk about corporate responsibility, they, there's always the cost involved. Um, but actually, there, is, um, there are real advantages too. I'm, I'm actually working on a uh, corporate volunteering strategy for the company I'm working for at the moment. And as part of the research that I've done, um, we've sort of talked a lot about um, skills that colleagues can learn. So for example, um, when uh, colleagues go and volunteer in you know, local communities or, or wherever, you know, they can gain skills such as teamwork skills and leadership skills. And these are actually really beneficial when they come back to the business afterwards. So, and there are many other advantages as well. So it's really important to concentrate on the advantages of corporate responsibility programs. Um, and I encourage those of you who work in um, global businesses, really push, push them forward in your businesses because um, they're, they're really great things. Thanks. Graham. So I have uh, Andrea Toledo from the Philippines and the conversation is going to be about, I think, ethics and technology and perhaps in the context of transfer. Um, hi. So basically, I'm a researcher, and what I would like to point out is something very specific. Um, when we talk about global business, I want to discuss about the pharmaceutical industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry that affects all of us. And uh, to be very specific, how in our generation can we be able to influence the very heavy and... Um, political maneuverings, uh, very heavy, very uh, strategic political maneuverings that pharmaceutical industries have on suppressing scientists. I am a researcher, I come from a science high school, I became a journalist because I want to popularize science. Um, how many of you here know someone who has cancer? Raise your hands. All right, a lot of you. 1930s, Royal Rife, the scientist already created the technology to cure cancer 100%. Dr. Hulda Clark, these are names that you should know. Dr. Hulda Clark was also from the United States. And she was uh, systematically, uh, at first she was applauded for her science, but then it became a big threat. Chemotherapy costs 300,000 US dollars. What is frequency technology all about? Google it, okay? I won't spend time explaining it to you tonight, uh, uh, today. But what I am saying here is that there are scientists who have the technology already to cure advanced stage cancers, 100%. 
I am collaborating currently with scientists from the United States. They can go to jail if I name them. And this is because of the pharmaceutical industry. Now, my question is, all of you believe, because of what the media says, because of what you know, the doctors say, that there is no 100% cure to cancer. There is research, Clark, Ro Hulda Clark, and Royal Rife. Now, my, and my proposition is for this global business and how it uh, shapes our society to also include, to be specific, no? how these multi-billion dollar industries are suppressing scientists who have invented and found cures already. And yet it's bad for business because a typical frequency technology is 6,000 US dollars versus a 300,000 US dollar chemotherapy. Now what do you do about that? Thank it's, you. It's Thank silent you. genocide. This is my point. It's silent genocide. If the technology has been existing since the 1930s... We need to cut you off, otherwise we're not going to get anyone else to speak, but yes, thank but you very much. Hopefully everyone would agree Everyone's on something about it's the great point. industry. You made a good point. Thank you. Oswald. Yes. Thomas Howard from the United Kingdom will talk about carbon pricing. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think we need to amend the resolution to tackle not just poverty, but climate change as well, because the two are interrelated, and you can't solve one without reference to the other. Um, I'm a believer in the free market. I believe in um, you know, competition between companies, between nations, to bring prosper prosperity to everyone. But the only way in, that w in which that works is where markets are not distorted by um, hidden, hidden, hidden costs or, or barriers to trade. And I think that for too long, carbon has gone unpriced in our economy so that we're not paying the true cost of the items that we, that we buy. And I think the way to influence the behavior and uh, the way in which we consume things is to price in the actual full carbon cost rather than have everyone subsidize it. In, in the end, it's the, the poorest in society, the poorest in the world that end up subsidizing that as well. And I think with developing countries, obviously the benefits that uh, international investment can bring are huge. And so there's a competition between nations to say, who can offer the most attractive business environment? Who can push salaries lower? Who can push working conditions lower? I think what we need to do is, is overturn that and look to build um, a global minimum wage, a global minimum standard for which all countries adhere. So there's no longer this competition on an unnatural level to subsidize businesses at the expense of the, you know, the poorest workers in society. Now, there seemed there seem to be a quite major reaction when the concept of including climate and poverty. Um, we'll do a very, very high-tech poll here. How many of you think that the resolution should actually include climate as well as poverty? Put your hands up. OK, that's about 80% of the room. So if we can amend the resolution by the time we actually pull it back up here to be poverty and climate, and then we'll vote on that as a resolution. Benita. This is Ali Hassan, who's from Pakistan, and he wants to talk about global business in developing countries. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ali from Pakistan. Uh, first, I would like to uh, appreciate uh, CEO of uh, Feed Foundation. She is really doing a great job. So congratulations. You are doing a really great job. Uh, when I was listening to uh, these speakers, uh, there was some question was arising in my mind. Uh, as I'm from Pakistan, the big issue in Pakistan is uh, unemployment. And uh, uh, people having a degrees and diplomas, but they don't have a job there. So uh, many of organizations, I, uh, I keep on watching news and keep on reading the advertisement that uh, they mention, the companies mention that we need a manager, but they must have three year experience or five year experience. So how could a fresh or graduate person can have experience if you won't give them any opportunity. So that's the very, uh, very big and uh, issue in Pakistan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We've probably got time for eight more. So two from each microphone. Right. Uh, we have Team Surrey from the UK, and um, he's going to tell us something about turning One Young World into an educational program. Hi there. Um, I think there's an opportunity for One Young World to develop into an educational program. And in my humble opinion, I think that every global business and school, college or university should have a responsibility to educate their people or children in the issues we've raised today. Thank you. Thank you.
so for what it's worth, I'm really pleased you put climate back in the resolution. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Lucien Tanowski from the United Kingdom is going to talk about the role of entrepreneurship in setting solutions. Just one thing before Lucien does, he actually is cheating and shouldn't be asking a question, um, but he can. But Lucien has actually been doing all of the social media behind One Young World and has done a fantastic job in terms of helping make sure this happens. So a round of applause for Lucien. I didn't realize I was cheating here. Thank you, David. Thank you for that. Um, it's been a great honor working with so many of you doing this. But uh, I wanted to share with you one of my favorite facts of the world. Uh, and that's of the world's 100 largest economies, uh, 51 are businesses and 49 are countries. Uh, now, what that says to me is the role of business is, is it's through business that we can change the world. And I think that uh, what I want to share with you is uh, something I'm really passionate about, and that's entrepreneurship. I want to share with you two things. Um, I would like for our generation to be the generation of entrepreneurs, this one young world generation, to feel what they're passionate about and know that they're enabled to do that with social media, just like One Young World's been able to, to be brought about through that. And secondly, call upon governments and companies to support young entrepreneurs in, 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 with their passions. And I think everybody should see, because One Young World perfectly demonstrates that, what a small number of highly engaged young people can really achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Here is this piece up from Greece. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much for this excellent plenary. Um, the title of the plenary is um, to call for global businesses to define and act on their roles. But I think it's equally important that we help to define this role because as our fellow delegates uh, put forth here, um, it's, it's true that businesses need to transform the long-term plans, but nowadays they still work on a business consciousness that is profit maximizing and it's selfish. And as Professor Yuna said, and I was really inspired by this, it's true that they could potentially work with a selfless uh, instinct of human nature. But so long as this transformation hasn't happened, I would like to put forth a more practical initiative of perhaps taking an initiative on an international or supranational level and saying that we create a common pool of funding, either in the form of a tax or in the form of a centralized donation, and then distribute that through experts who are going to define the structural needs of poor countries, or in the form of humanitarian aid, and distribute that um, again in the third world countries, because it's all about redistribution, tackling poverty, as uh, other people said, it's not about giving donations, it's about redistributing wealth. So that's all I want to put forth, thank you. Thank you. Benita. So we've had some comments earlier about the importance of entrepreneurship. And um, Joshua here from London wants to talk about how money is taking control of us. <laughs> um, yeah, money is taking control of us and we're in a losing battle really. And I find that businesses have had a large proportion and has actually caused a lot of poverty um, in the past. And if we, um, they can help eliminate this, and if they do, we can probably start winning this battle. A lot of businesses are helping us at the moment, like Apple and Windows, but there are also a large proportion of them who are um, setting us back. So for every two steps we take forward, we're taking one back, and it's really unfair to everyone else, and we are now dying because of them. Elio. Jed Vargas from Venezuela is going to tell us something about a trading project. Hi, good afternoon. Um, well, first of all, I want to explain what is this all, all about. Um, a few weeks ago, I was trying to work with this. It's a kind of project that involves people from, um, I don't understand it in, in English, but it's some kind of favela in our country. It's like the really poor class. And sometimes they even doesn't have money enough to put uh, a product on the internet. So we, we figure out an idea how these people can uh, make business without have any cost. So maybe if they have something that they don't need and they want to, they need something, and they can put this article on the internet on a web page that we're going to create, and they can exchange this with another person inside the country. And the idea of all this is that they are not going to use money, currency, or something. They're just going to exchange one single product with another one, and. With this idea, we are trying to make benefit from the publicity, and from that 
can, we can expand all these uh, through the country. And that's a great idea, I guess. Maybe if one another country can, add, uh, can get involved with this, can get information from me um, while the summit. Thank you. Great. A couple of final comments. Graham. Lee Parker from the United Kingdom to talk about uh, CSR. Hi. Um, just like Sam down in the corner, I'm also quite proud of my company for its corporate social responsibility, um, from sending sponsored delegates to here to sponsoring apprentices to build schools in Africa and feeding programs. So just with that, really, I just wanted to quickly say, um, in a challenging economy, I don't think um, companies should be looking at CSR as a cost to cut, but instead increase the budget. Agree. Yes, Ali Ram um, from the UK, born in India, will make a brief comment on the promise of capitalism. Um, the Honourable Delegate from Hong Kong seemed to be advocating um, positive discrimination in employment as a form of social responsibility, you know, hiring the needier over the less needy. And what I was wondering is, aren't we straying too close to undermining the premise of capitalism and meritocracy? We meritocracy upon which our society is very carefully poised. <laughs> Benito? I think that following on from that, Michael Teo from Malaysia wants to talk about companies investing in young people and empowering young people. Thank you. Salam Sajatra to all of you in uh, One Young World, uh, dear councillors. Um, a point I would like to share is that I feel there's a larger role for multinational corporations or businesses to invest in youths, either startup entrepreneurs. Now, what I mean by investing in them is in two ways. Number one is to provide more financial needs for uh, to launch projects. For example, we have been involved with the Global Entrepreneurship Week, and it's sad because back in my country, corporations do not invest so much on grassroots activities, grassroots activities by us youths. In fact, they would rather waste large chunks of monies uh, engaging consultants to consult them on how to launch projects on CSR angles. But we as youth, we have the solutions. So I believe global business should wake up to that. And the second point is uh, a lot of companies that I've known of tend to accuse us youths as being naive and not knowing what we're doing. But if that's the case, I would tend to say that why not provide us with a mentoring system, a mentor community uh, that is made out of global conglomerates, uh, people of uh, stature, global leaders to advise us and guide us. And together we all can make the world a better place, starting with the grassroots, starting with the power of young people. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. Adam Purvis from the UK has an announcement very relevant to this audience. Okay, just to follow on from this, we've now got a One Young World uh, alumni chat room on LinkedIn. It's a group. You can all join it right now and we can streamline this conversation because everybody's Excellent. been talking about the impact group and the ideas factory. Um, we can now just from this moment onwards move forward with that and everybody in this room get discussing online, streamlining these ideas so they're ready to deliver to resolution level by the end of this conference. Um, that's that. Uh, by the way, I've met some fantastic people here. We've got people in this room with connections into NATO, you know, UN, European Parliament. We are a great network. If we pull our heads together, we're going to get all of this done. So. Now, um, if you all promise to do a 20-second spiel, we can get the remaining five of you who've been waiting for, patiently in. So it literally needs to be 20 seconds. So you snuck up with that. The others will be waiting for about 20 minutes, so I'm sorry we're going to have to move to there. <laughs> Catherine from South Africa. Hi, I'm Catherine. I actually am here. I'm South African. I live and work in the UK for the International Award for Young People, which some of you may know is the Duke of Edinburgh's Award. Um, my colleague over there, sorry, I don't know your name, just echoed, uh, just mentioned our networks. We are all members of extraordinary networks. We have a huge representative voice, a huge collective voice. Um, I really, I mean, we, we speak of dignity, we speak of, of human capacity, and I think it's absolutely vital that we all, every single one of us, take a personal, concrete action away with us. Yeah. Um, we have the fora, we have the capacity to discuss and share these personal, concrete actions and where we go with them in the coming years. We are the leaders of tomorrow, we are also the business leaders of tomorrow, and we are demanding of global business, uh, you know, this... Um, we're demanding of global business action and definition in our role to fight against climate change and poverty. We are demanding that of ourselves. So go back to your networks, your UN agencies, your youth organizations, your youth. 
organizations, um, your schools, your colleges, your businesses, and let's, let's do something meaningful. Oswald, we'll, we'll stay with you, just 20 seconds. I, yes, please, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm Rezana from Jordan. Uh, I just want to uh, add, uh, add something about more than the things that have been said, that uh, in, the in, in the developing countries, uh, actually the CSRs, the, the global co uh, corporation are not really uh, aware of, about the CSR. And uh, that's the problem, uh, which, uh, which, which are not working on developing their countries. So I'm urging the youth here just to uh, the, in the developing countries to, uh, um, th to put their hands together to, uh, to aware these uh, co uh, corporations about the importance of that and to develop their countries. Thank you. Great. Also, if you want to come back on stage, Graham, you as well. And if we Lynn do the three Lyle. people at that mic, and one there. Lynn Lai from New Zealand would like to talk about fair trade. And she's asking a question, which is, why is there an alternative? Should it not be fair trade or no trade? Um, hi, everyone. So a delegate for, um, from over there pointed out that um, businesses are um, accountable to us. We are the customers. So the most of the question that we should be asking ourselves is that why aren't we demanding fair trade? Because they have to listen to us. At the end of the day, we're the ones who buy their products. So I think we play a bigger role in all of this. And so um, if you've heard of the story of stuff, um, you can Google it online. It's, yeah. They ask you, when you go to a store and you buy something really cheap, say a clock radio for $4.95, who is it affecting? Who is not getting paid? Who, whose wages are being pressed down so that we can get it at a cheaper price? So um, right. start tomorrow. When you make a decision about Thank buying you. something, think about the consequences. And, yeah. Right. <laughs> we'll stay with you. So we have uh, Jin Yeon from Malaysia. <laughs> um, before we vote on this resolution, I would just like to point out a few things. Like the previous two resolutions passed out very, uh, is passed like very easily. But actually, like uh, for for example, the, in the environment um, forum, I I spoke, and after that, a group of us were discussing about like if we are really losing direction right here. Because, okay, um, I'll just talk a little about greenwashing since someone mentioned um, the, uh, about climate in, in this global business um, forum. A while ago, I was in Denmark during the COP15. And then um, I saw this um, billboard um, at, at the bus station. It's Coca-Cola. And then um, it's about going green and blah, 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 stuff like that. And then somebody used a green marker to write on it. Dear Coca-Cola. It's very good that you are actually conveying such messages, but it doesn't cancel all the SHIT that you do. So the thing now is that, um, okay, um, initially I thought greenwashing, um, although it defeats the whole purpose, is pretty good because it actually uh, sends the messages right across. But I feel that we have been doing that for way too long. We need to move beyond that. And I, that, I think that, um, applies to this conference as well. Like the resolutions that we are voting for, it's very vague, okay? It's merely like slogans that you just um, speak. Yeah, yeah it's, it's merely slogans and propaganda. It, there's nothing substantial inside. So do we actually know what we are voting for? Okay, like we are, we are no difference from the leaders that we criticize so eloquently. <laughs> well, um, thank you. <laughs> and finally, from Elio, we're closing with uh, uh, Christian Jucadella from Spain uh, telling us something about environment and some global standards ideas. Hello, um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here and uh, um, adding your local wise uh, support. Well, I just, to come up with, um, with a term that no one has yet come up with, which I find essential, uh, those who work in media, you know what I'm talking about, which is information. The, me 
simple term of information, which, for, which, for, uh, which will be for some of you very broad and vague, but I found it's essential. Um, therefore, I, I was thinking along this morning that it could be a good idea to promote, to launch, the, um, to come up with a global standard uh, state's governments uh, certificates or exams, you know, based on sustainability, basic information about sustainability, especially addressed to those of you who might know or, uh, well, general people that might not afford um, degree, uh, go to good school, you know, therefore I think governments could uh, support this issue, the information itself. Thank you. Benita Elia, do you want to come back up and join us? And let's put our hands together for some amazing delegate speakers. Well done. If you guys can go back down so you can join the vote.